Everyone in B'nai Akiva would have heard of the B'nai Akiva journey from Chanech to Madrich to making Aliyah and beyond. This film is going to look back at B'nai Akiva's journey from 80 years ago in Grich Castle to Thaxted and the Hachsharot all the way through to modern B'nai Akiva. It's going to look at the impact it's had, the lives it's touched and the effect it's had on Anglo Jewry and beyond. The Mishnah Pirkeva tells us, Ben Shmonim Likvora, when you turn 80, you are strong. And that certainly is the case with regard to the Nea Kiva UK, now celebrating 80 glorious years since its creation. I would like to pay tribute to the Tnu'a. Thanks to Bnei Akiva, so many individuals and families and communities have been inspired. And as a result of being part of the success story of Bnei Akiva, there has been a strengthening of the commitment to Torah ve'avodah, Torah values, a Torah way of life, and of course, recognizing the centrality of Medinat Israel in our lives. So on this very special anniversary, to the Tnu'ah I say, Todah Rabbah, thank you so much, and may you only go genuinely from strength to added strength in the future. Bnei Akiva, I congratulate you on your 80th birthday. That's eight decades of Zionist activism. That's eight decades of instilling Jewish values. That's eight decades of people going on Aliyah and making a contribution to the Jewish state. You know, as you look back over the last 80 years, Bnei Akiva can be proud of what you've done in this country, in the United Kingdom, and what you've done for Israel too. Keep on doing what you've been doing. Mazal tov. Kristallnacht, 9th of November, 10th of November. That was the turning point where everybody made every effort to get out. My parents decided to enroll me in what was called the Kinder Transport. The crowds of young people who had been members of Bahad. Bahad was the Chalutz part of the religious Zionist movement, which had been started off in Poland and in Germany in the late 20s. And suddenly we had a whole group of people in their late teens and twenties who by nature were natural matrichim. Outside Manchester, on the way to Castle in Rochdale, there was a Hachshara farm of Bachat. The man who organized it was a man called the, the late Ariel Hendler, and that really made the big change and it became a serious movement. Ari Hendler was the emissary, the Shaliach, who had grown up in Germany, had come to Palestine, and they asked Ari to come to England and to organize Bnei Akiva and Bachat. He was an understated leader of the Jewish people. More than organizing Bnei Akiva and Bachat, it was first of all to get them out of Germany, and if so, then to look after them in some way within the framework of Bachat Bnei Akiva, keep them religious and keep them as a society which educates not just to roam the streets or land up in a family which is unsuitable. He really gave of himself and built up the state of Israel and the Jewish people. He was an inspirational character for the things that he'd done and the things 
that he'd seen. Arya Handler was really for Bene Akiva the person that linked the generations. He was there at the declaration of the state and the stories that he had from back then from being a proper chalutz where life was a lot tougher than for us just having everything on Machane. And to him Bene Akiva was the most special place to be. He gave everything to the movement. And I think that just that love that Arya had that was passed to his Chanachim that was passed to their Chanachim and has gone from generation to generation Bechol Do is so important and really makes Bnei Kiv what it is today. Farmers who were interested because of the labour shortage to have a working force. So we worked for farmers who were willing to give us a house. There were at any one time six or seven of them. There was a Gürch Castle which was an important place at the beginning. And there must have been in Gürch Castle 40 or 50 youngsters. And Arya Handler was there and got married there. By 1942-3, the Bahad movement realized that it had to have more Balabatish support from English jury and raise funds in order to buy a farm where we would be our own masters. And that's the house tax that came into being. My name is Verity Steele. I grew up literally three fields distance away from here. I hadn't a clue that this farm was a Jewish farm until I went to work for the Kibbutz Chamber Orchestra in Israel in 1987. It set me off on a trail which has lasted so far eight years. There were some people who had their permanent jobs. If you were a tractor driver, you were a tractor driver. And there were those people who were relatively new who had to be allotted to whatever season that was going on. This place became a real haven. They were all young people together. You started working at about seven o'clock and the various crops that we grew. You worked until dinner time. That was one o'clock, that hour's rest carry on from four to six, come home, get showered, have supper, and then the evening would be Chiorin, Ivrit, history, quite intensive cultural programs. By the mid-1950s, it was getting harder and harder to recruit Bahad trainees. There wasn't the influx of refugees that there had been in the early years, and it was with a lot of regret and heavy-heartedness that in 1962 the farm was sold. Going Hashkara was a year in Israel. The first four and a half months or so would be half day studies and half day work. Studies included uh, Ivrit, history and geography and things like that. Mixed into that with Tiulim. Then we spent a month in Jerusalem. We spent a week in Emek Bet Sha'an. And then we came back for about six months of just full time work on the kibbutz. It was definitely a catalyst for cementing your views of what you wanted to do in the future and how you wanted to see yourself. I spent many, many hours of my teenage and university years stenciling papers and arranging machanot in the Wilsdon Bight in Wilsdon Lane. When I was 17, I went up to Manchester. So I was in Manchester, Bnei Akiva, for a year before I went on Akshara. I remember the old building. It had cellars and secret rooms. I remember they were all creaky old houses in need of great repair. There were never any modern facilities as such, but we saw ourselves as being young, radical pioneers, and I think we made the most of it as well. The place was in a terrible, terrible state, but when it came down eventually, it brought many tears to people's eyes because it had so much character. In 1970, the United Synagogue had its centenary celebrations. 
One of the events was a gala dinner at the Dorchester Hotel in which the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh came. It was the first time the Queen had come to any official Jewish event. And she was to be greeted by a guard of honor. And it was decided in the United Synagogue that guard of honor would be composed of four members of every Zionist and Jewish youth movement. And I was one of the four selected or picked to be a member of the B'nai Akiva Guard of Honor. Then certainly in the 70s and 80s, it was very successful. big event uh, that I remember and I was obviously a major part of was when I was Muskeer we did what we call the Tale of Two Mafia. And when I played the Muskeer for my sins and uh, they, they were just great memories. It was an amazing event, about 1500 people at Piccadilly Theatre and it was something we worked on for the whole year. If I'm not mistaken I think that same uh, musical has been performed at least twice more. Probably most of you know me as Rosh Machanet on Lock, Stock and Two Smoke Sign Bagels in the West End stage. It grew into this wonderful phenomenon that it was and the fact that we were able to, to sell out the, the theatre was, was really incredible. How's it going? So far so good. Everything's jamming. La 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 da 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 da. There are quite a lot of defining moments for me. My favourite one's probably National Weekend. The first one was in 89 and Rav David Millstone was the person who organised this and it was down in Cornwall, freezing cold in a holiday village. It really showed how B'nai Akiva was part of something bigger. It wasn't just about me as a Chanich at that age and my friends, but it was something much more. And you see how the message is enduring and how people are engaged with it. It was then that Gil White decided he had to do this again and we went to Great Yarmouth. We had then Chief Rabbi Sachs, Chief Rabbi Lau standing on chairs, English policemen standing on chairs and singing for hours and hours. The next one Eliovitz arranged, it was outstanding. All the parents found that it was a reunion with other parents who had been in the movement as well. The weekend was completely run by now looking back at it, a bunch of children. The way that the young people managed to cater for 700 people every meal is just a miracle. I think that's when I really saw the enormity of what B'nai Akiva does and the peer leadership. And the last one that they had was in 2006. The Masquerade at the time, Danny Seal, wanted to get the entire movement back together again and just getting people back up on the chairs at the table, singing the songs that they loved. National Weekend was actually the first event that I went on and it was just incredible to see it. all different generations from every single Shevet. That's when I realised the power that B'nai Akiva can have and the ability for young people to make a difference and to educate and to pull off something truly amazing. I left that weekend really with a sense of I want to be a part of that. The first personality I remember is Rav Benny Lau, who was the shaliach who ran the uh, Israel Winter 98 camp. It was decided that from year eight upwards, Winter Machane would be in Israel. And we all marched down to the Kotel where Chief Rabbi Lau was waiting for us. And there were hundreds of people singing. I'd never experienced anything like that. And people came out of their shops and passers-by 
were waving and cheering. To go down to the cutout all together as a youth movement was a really, really powerful experience. I remember the most are definitely Machane. For me, Machane was always about learning the real Ruach of B'nai Kiva. Where we really did probably more in a week than the many sniffing we could do in a whole year. It's about accepting challenges, learning who you are, making Chavirim and Chavirot who will be friends of yours for life. But it was great to meet these people in the summer and in the winter and to see them becoming not just in themselves. I just loved being with like-minded people. Growing up in Newcastle, there were very few Jewish kids. And therefore, for me, B'nai Kiva and Machana in particular was my lifeline to other Jewish children of my own age. We had some fantastic ups and downs from being swamped out at Machlaka in the torrential rainfall in Somerset and having to be saved by Rakaz to just running fantastic Polot and teaching the next generation. The incredible Ruach there was when we were singing at Machana, when we had maybe 100, 120 people stood up in the middle of a meal, we wouldn't even let the Madrachim get anything done because we were so busy singing constantly. It was all good fun. One of the standout dates in the B'nai Kiva calendar every single year is Yom Ha'atzmaut. It is the time when the entire community, whatever age, whatever the background, come together and experience a true Chag. You have a packed out shul, you have dignitaries, whether it be from political parties to the local mayor. We're all singing halal, all davening and praying together is really such a special moment. It gives you goosebumps just being in that room. Just sitting and listening and joining in with halal seeing everyone coming together with a true Ahavat Yisrael. I think it's always been amazing. And then to go from the seriousness of the ceremony and then to downstairs to the celebration, the excitement and the party for Yom Hatzmer is really, really a highlight of my year and I know so many others. Lots of people inspired me in B'nai Kiva. The people that inspired me in B'nai Kiva were, first of all, my friends. You learn from them, first of all, how to become a madrich. Like the things I learned on my first and second machane, I didn't know I had these things in me. I kept on seeing people who were like me, who were normal, who were accessible, and who I felt that one day I could be like them. And that's one of the amazing things about B'nai Akiva, is it's peer-led and you learn from everyone around you. What these people do, a level of chanichim, a level of madrichim, a level of bogrim, the maskira, is really working miracles to inspire uh, the next generation of young Anglo-Jewish leaders. The numerous shlichim throughout the years have always played a major role in inspiring all those within the movement. David Jackson was our shaliach. He was the first shaliach ever to come to Ilford because he considered Ilford was a growth area. Ilford at the time was the biggest Jewish community in Europe. There was one shaliach, Nehemia Rappel, who was very, very influential and I'm in close contact with him still to this day. There are some unbelievable people that I've met within my tough kids and some incredible influences such as Asher Kalingold. I remember when I met him, someone asked him, what do you think B'nai Kiva's role is within society today? Because he turned around to the group and he said that B'nai Kiva's role now is to show people who have the same ideology but have different opinions being able to come together and agree because all that we want is Judaism and Israel to be better off. If you look at people like Michael Rainsbury and Johnny Lipser who have given so much of their life over to B'nai Akiva and I look at those type of people then I see people who I really respect. Johnny Lipser played a massive role in my inspiration to be involved. He has that way of making people feel a part of it and making you feel um, special. And he certainly did that when he trained me up to be Mazkira. I think it's fair to say that Mark Weinberg was one of those people that when you came into contact with him, you knew that you had been affected by or come into contact with someone who was genuinely making a difference. He was all about the small detail, the small things that make people engaged with the organisation. And at the other end, he saw the big idea. He realised that to get people really motivated by the Nekiva so that it had a longevity to it, so people would continue to be part of the Tanua. He had to deliver something over and above what had been happening at the time. He did it so that people would feel a long-term attachment to the Nekiva. I can't really let this pass without mentioning Yoni Jesna, one of my friends in my Shevet, who had a huge impact 
on us when he was living and with us and make a huge impact on Anglo Jewry, but in particular on our Shevet. I think it's fair to say that there's no other youth movement that has had a bigger impact on the lives of so many people in the UK. Black Eva has been my life from a very early age. It had its impact, there's no question about it. I needed a place where I could fit in and, and almost nurture my Judaism. You belong to a club and to me it gave me that sense of belonging. It's the youth voice for modern orthodoxy, religious Zionism. It got me to Israel. When I look back at my age group, 80% of the people we were involved in with Bnei Akiva at the time, all of them are living there today with children and grandchildren, and therefore in that sense it was a great success. For me, Bnei Akiva is where my real Jewish learning and love for Judaism and Israel has come from. Where people can come to learn about Judaism in a way which is not in the school setting, a way which is dynamic and experiential, and it's really defining for their Jewish identity. Bnei Akiva has been in a unique place to teach Jewish leadership and inspire the next generation of Jewish leaders. Modern Orthodox leadership and religious Zionism begins with B'nai Akiva. That's where you learn who you are, what Judaism means to you. We take people who are very young and say, you take this group, you now educate the next generation. And I think that has a massive knock-on effect. To see all the leaders of schools, of large Jewish organisations across the community being led by madrachim and role models of B'nai Akiva is just unparalleled. I think what I do today as an educator is certainly the main influence and the main reason for that was what I did in B'nai Akiva. A lot of the people that I love and cherish and are dear to me are from B'nai Akiva. And B'nai Akiva was really important to me from a social element. It provides people with a peer group that remains with them for the rest of their life. We're still all in touch even though people live all over the world. My best friends now are my friends that I met as as a Madrich or as a Maski root member. We've all got this bond that if we needed each other, we'd be there for each other. So when I go down to London now, invariably I see people that I used to go to Machane with and it's incredible. It's like we just spoke yesterday, even though we've not spoken for 20, 30 years or whatever it may be. B'nai Kiv isn't just the place where you meet your friends and you meet your peers that you take on for the rest of your life, but also for some of us, it's the place where we meet our future spouse. Obviously meeting me was Sarah's most defining moment. Um, I think it's and, the other way around. Yeah, exactly. And for me <laughs> meeting Sarah. <laughs> B'nai Akiva being 80 years old, it's a major landmark. And the reason why is the passion. This is a movement that is at the heart of people, that drives people to, to better it. It's just amazing how it's evolved over time. I think the message of where B'nai Akiva has been and where it's going aligns itself to what Ari Handler set about when he started it in this country. Torah Avodah. Torah has to be the centre of everything that we do. But the methodology has to change. Times are changing even more quickly in recent years and BA is moving with the times. It's always new, it's always fresh and it's always relevant for the current generation. You know, I remember getting on Svivag as a Madrid, all of the materials before BA on a Shabbos afternoon and then it became all digitised and then it went out via email and now there are YouTube channels. The movement has an incredibly important place in the future of this community and our community and I think that it's important for those of us who are Bogrim of the Tenuat to continue to support it because there isn't anything else like it. If that continues, that fire in its members and its Madrachim and its Bogrim, then we'll see a hundred, we'll see two hundred, we'll see Bnei Akiva in this country going very strong for many years to come. I love Bnei Akiva because it's given me so much. My family, my friends, a set of values a connection to the land of Israel and to the state of Israel. I love B'nai Akiva because it's given me an ideology that I can call my own. I love BA because I had loads of fun. I love B'nai Akiva because I'm a BA mug. <laughs> that side. I love B'nai Akiva because it is the only organization in Anglo Jewry doing what it's doing and doing it well. I love B'nai Akiva because it's the only place I can get away with eating Coca-Cola chicken on a Friday night. I love B'nai Akiva 
because it gave me content in my life as a young person. I love Benair Kiva because it gave me a chance to appear on the West End stage. I love Benair Kiva because it makes everyone feel that they're part of a family. I love Benair Kiva because Benair Kiva has given me so much and moulded me into the person I am today.